Welcome to Today in EVE Online. It is Friday, January 24, 2020. We are back after a hiatus of about two months. Uh, we decided to take some time off, and uh, we're going to have a conversation about talking in stations in general. We're going to talk about this show, Today in EVE Online, and uh, we'll also get into the news and maybe even do a little bit of a review of what happened in the last two months, although... You probably know, since you were watching or listening to Talking in Stations proper. Um, but first, I want to say hi to my friend Litchgrave. What's going on? That's your cue. Hello, Litchgrave, are you there? Do I have to push talk? Okay, so maybe he took yeah. off. I said hello. Welcome. Oh, no, sorry. I, I just had to quickly run away. My apologies. Oh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. You know? Yeah. Last Christmas break. Now we're back. Right. Uh, and we haven't talked since maybe your uh, Christmas special on uh, 2019 in review, uh, the How to Make Money review, basically, where we talked about... Well, it was a funny show because it started out with you and Ash Dorothy, and I jumped in, and next thing I know, you're like <laughs> pushed out of the chair <laughs> and on the floor while I took over the show, and we talked for an additional two to four hours. I think it was like four-hour show. It was a five-hour show. Yeah, yeah, that was... But that was great. I love it. It, it. it got an amazing reception. It still, you know, 500 some of viewers on, on YouTube, no dislike. People were saying that they could watch us for hours on end. Somebody said that they were going to come back and watch us every year for that. Wow. That much yeah. success, huh? I like that. <laughs> well, it was fun because it turned into um, Ashtarothi and I really just kind of going back into 2019. But we also go went and did the whole decade. And, uh, and with you there, it turned into the, the, the money-making aspect of EVE Online and that was not released as a podcast, so if you're listening to this, that's not available uh, as a podcast. Uh, we may actually put it out. It was five hours long, um, but it was... Five hours, two minutes, 11 seconds. So yeah, it'll. we could cut it up into parts. Yeah, right. Do like a three-hour thing. Maybe we should do that for um, Patreons, give them some bonus content. So that's one of the things we've been thinking about at Talking in Station. There's about 40 of us that work at this station and it's just like a corporation. There's usually, you know, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the full corporation is actually active in, in a significant way. A lot of people are kind of dormant until they're needed. But there are some key people at Talking In Stations that are like working every day and checking in every day, dropping information all the time. And even people who aren't officially TIS are... Uh, in touch with me constantly, like just giving me information. It's weird that after all this time, there's been this massive progression of ability to report on what's going on in EVE Online that is is not unexpected. It's very typical. And, and that is when you first start out, you're intimidated by not knowing what you don't know. So when I first started in 2015 in earnest, I was writing, but... Um, when I first did my first podcast, which was almost five years ago, I'll explain why I know that in a second. Uh, when I first started, I, my very first comment was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I don't have any contact. You know, there's just a few people that I know here and there. I knew more people than I was saying, but it was true. I didn't have like a lot of contact. And now five years later, people seek me out to give me information to say, hey, here's an update on our situation. And I take all those calls, you know, over Discord, take all those calls. Um, I read what they say. I'm super grateful that they're doing that because it saves me a lot of effort. And it also keeps me informed. And, uh, and then I double check it all with other sources to see if it all makes sense. And everybody has been really good about giving me just proper information. It's nothing actionable, um, but it is uh, something that you can use as a summary so that you have at least some exposure to what's going on in EVE Online in different parts of the game. And that is extremely, extremely valuable for a, like, 
for an organization like ours that is, I wouldn't say we're a news organization, but more of a fan organization that talks about what's going on in the game, what players are getting up to and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> I'll take this moment to say hi to the 30 viewers that are watching us. What's going on? I am watching chat here. Also, we'll open the mic if you guys want to come into uh, TIS Discord and jump into the channel we're in. You can hang out with us and uh, tell us what you're up to in EVE Online. Yep. Okay. Okay, first thing I wanted to cover is talking in stations, what are we doing? Well, quick history on talking in stations. It's a little self-serving, but we'll do it, right? It's the first time we're back in today in EVE Online. We want to kind of warm up, let people uh, realize that we're on and then join us. So we're going to go through this new little... New year, new viewers. Yeah. <laughs> <Catch everybody. laughs> we're going to go through this little period of uh, uh, history for TIS. And actually, it kind of centers around... Um, I, I hate talking about myself in third person, but uh, but centers around this Matterall persona that I've taken up. But about uh, six or seven years ago, well, I've been playing since 2008. About seven years ago, I, I got experienced enough to talk about the game in writing. So I would write articles and research articles. And actually, the thing I wrote about first, uh, and it was about, um, I want to say 2011 or 12, the thing I wrote about first was the Alliance Tournament, and I broke down the history of the Alliance Tournament from where it started. There is no Alliance Tournament 1, for instance. It only starts at Alliance Tournament 2 uh, because it was called the Kaldari uh, Championships. Um, I think it was Kaldari Championships that's before that. Right. Yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that was in that article. So it was really like deep knowledge kind of thing. And I talked about the, you know, uh, the importance of it and what it meant and where it came out of and all that kind of stuff. And so that's where I started in way back in 2012 or something. Uh, and then it went, <clears throat> I started writing articles anonymously and I didn't even have a, a pen name. And then I, thank you for welcoming me back there. Uh, look backward. Um, so then I just decided I needed a pen name. So I said, okay, where do I get, I need a pen name because I can't write under my usual because basically I'm going to make people angry and I don't want to be hunted in the game because I made somebody angry. So, and I didn't want to be like space famous, they call it. So I didn't, I didn't care. I just need a name that I can just use and just, you know, throw away when I'm done writing. And so then I thought, well, I want to talk a little bit about news. So what's my favorite news program? All things considered. And so I kind of played with that really quickly. This all happened in seconds. And I was like, well, all things that matter. And then I reversed it to matter all. And that's how matter all the name was developed. I was, again, a completely different character. So then matter all was used to write articles. And I just started writing them fast. And uh, I think I wrote 100 articles for EN24. While I was there, I was an editor. And then I moved over to INN, or at the time it was TMC, and then I talked to Scion, and we, you know, I was like, you know what, I want to run an organization. I actually want to run it so that I can uh, really make sure that the news is, um, first of all, the articles are bigger with more detail, um, that the articles are fair, that they represent motivations of people, not any kind of narratives that people are trying to push through. So that was our, uh, my goal, my personal goal. And he said, well, if you want to do that, do it here at TMC. I'll give you the keys. Nobody can override your decisions as an editor. And so I said, I'll take it. And at the time, I was writing like the interest. I hate to put it this way, but I was writing the interesting articles. There was a lot of like, this battle happened and this happened. Um, here's a new mechanic and this happened. Here's a new game. And, you know, they were, they were all over the place. There's no discipline to TMC at the time. It started out great a few years ago before that. And then it had gotten to a point where it was uh, being criticized heavily for just not having great content. And then I uh, came around and started putting up more thought pieces and digging into the news in deeper ways. And that was the whole thing that I brought at that point. So, 
then I took over the news and then I tried to develop writers and I was the, the uh, key editor there. And then this thing happens uh, in 2015, I think, in the spring where it's 16, actually, 15, where the Imperium is getting pushed out of the north. It's called World War B or the uh, Easter War or uh, the War of Solveless Aggression or what I called it, the Mercenary Wars. And that was... Um, when I was putting out a bunch of articles and I started up this uh, show, Talking in Stations. Now, before that, I had done Eve News 24 podcast. I did 25 episodes of that, and it really came to an end. Our like, 25th episode was a goodbye, a goodbye episode. Like, we had closed that. And uh, um, that was very produced. It came out every two weeks, and I loved it. When I go back and listen to it, I can, I can feel all the like love and humor in it with my friend Tiberius, my friend uh, Solon 101. And uh, I was really sad. I was really sad to like close that podcast, but it, it was like it had, it had run its course. And so then when I was at TIS, I thought, well, I don't want to do a podcast again. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> so let's do this other thing that is um, this new streaming thing, right? Because I was um, inheriting a streaming division with... Um, I'm just going to call it INN, but at the time it was TMC with INN. So we thought, well, this is what we'll do. We'll take that podcast concept and we'll take the editors of INN and we'll just talk for an hour about the news that we've already dug up and reported on in paper. And that's what talking in stations will be. It wasn't my title. It was another editor's title. His name was Ryan. And he's just a funny, smart guy. And he said... He said, oh, yeah, you know, instead of walking in stations, I'll just call it talking in stations. And I was just, I burst out laughing and I just thought, that's great. Again, just a throwaway name for something temporary like Matterall, the name Matterall. And so I, I said, okay, talking in stations and I won't be in it. We'll just get these people that are more streamer. Uh, I'll just produce it, right? I'll write up the news. I'll put up the scripts. I'll actually engineer it. But I won't be on it. It will be this guy I really liked named Drayden from Open Comms because he never got a chance to talk between Dirk McGurk and, at the time, BC, Big Country. Those two guys were two heavyweights, right? So you have two heavyweights talking on that show, and then he would try to, like, say something, and he would have all the actual information. I just loved it. I loved um, when he would talk. It was a great time for Open Comms. That was a great time for Open Comms, but it had a lot of tension in it, but it was still... A, it was still a different show. It was really, there was something in there that was pretty special. And, but I wanted to say, hey, Drayden, why don't you come over to this other show? I'll build it around you because you're a personality that I would like to see a show built around. Um, and I'll give you space to talk because you'll be the host. And then I need a co-host to go with you that I like to listen to, that is interested in many things and has that sense of humor and that easy give and take. And so Drayden was then paired up with someone I knew at the time, Nystrick, who had been on the meta show, but she was in test. And I think she was kind of, I don't know what happened. She kind of got pushed out of, of meta show, which was too bad because I think I do know what happened, but it gets into personal stuff, like personal feelings about things. So it's nothing bad, but she was kind of pushed out of Meta Show, so I wanted to see if she was available. So, so Talking in Stations was developed to be a, sh uh, a streaming show with Drayden and Nystrick together, two people that I wanted to see kind of banter back and forth, talk about games, talk about uh, Eve News and that sort of stuff. And then I would be the producer and start developing it. Well, at that exact time, Something had happened. Oh, yeah. Dirk McGurk had uh, done something that... I don't know if my volume's high enough. He'd done something that he so really far. regretted, and he was self-banishing himself. Like He's like, I'm, I'm not doing talking stations anymore. Sorry, I'm not doing open comms anymore. I'm going to take some time off. Actually, um, and I felt bad for him because I was a huge fan of Dirk's and... So I would write him and say, come on, um, 
you know, take some time off. Don't give up, but, you know, take some time off. And uh, I would just kind of like, uh, you know, be a friend to him and, and say some nice things and uh, try to get him to not be so hard on himself because he's, he's harder on himself than most people are. And in doing so, I was rehabilitating Dirk and I was creating a show at the same time. And so Dirk kind of moved into talking in stations. <laughs> and I was like, uh, here I am telling Dirk like, hey man, it's all right, don't give up. At the same time, there's this opportunity in a show. How can I not put those two things together? So it was very natural to have that. So the very first talking in stations that happened four years ago this April is Dirk McGurk with Drayden. Nystrick couldn't make it, so she fell out of it. And so BC was like super mad because it open comms was Dirk, Drayden, and BC. And BC was the only guy not on talking in stations. Essentially, he was replaced by, it turns out, me because we needed a third. I think, I don't remember how that happened, but it, with Nystrick falling out, the chemistry was broken and Dirk was in there, so it became a different thing. And then by the time we actually presented a few weeks later, it was just a different thing. And at that's, that's actually when we said, let's just make it straight news, not about other games, talk about EVE Online. And it, and it went into this whole, um, we just got shot out of a rocket uh, because like a rocket, we were shot out of a cannon. How's that? Because right then when we started up, there was this big war starting to form. Like the week that we started reporting is the week that Pan Fa Pandemic Legion was headed north for the 2016 invasion uh, of Imperium Space. Uh, NC Dot was starting to gear up, you know, they were about to move. So that's the setting when Talking in Station started. We started when, uh, call it what you like, World War B, Casino War, uh, Easter War, uh, Mercenary War, whatever. When that was starting, Talking in Station started. So for your milestone oriented people, that's what was going on. And that was quite exciting, but we were thrown in over our head, our technical as our technical microphones were bad. Um, there's a lot of room noise. It's just production wise, it's not a great situation. And that was, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Captain Pugwash. Yeah, so that's when it all started. That was like four years ago. And since then, all we ever wanted to do was sit down, have a discussion, talk about EVE Online in a newsworthy way. And the driving force of that was always uh, me as that matter all character bringing the news and bringing the sensibilities. And so what I thought was, uh, okay, so I did create this for somebody else. It didn't work out. The chemistry fell apart because one of the co-hosts fell apart. Um, if it's going to happen, I'm going to have to do it myself. And that's kind of how it felt. And Dirk was... Um, kind of sidelined at the time and he's a huge asset he gives you an enormous amount of confidence because that guy you want to talk to him and you want to listen to him and he's earned it over many years i know uh you know everybody has good and bad points and i'm sure there's some critics about like oh i can't listen to him he talks too loud or he talks too long or whatever but um no Dirk is a huge asset uh, i will never say anything different from that and i know that from years and years of being a fan and watching them. So that component could not be ignored. That was a big part of the beginning of talking in stations. But the idea of this driving thing was I got to get in and do it myself. And that's how talking in stations started. So now what? Years later, right? Four years later, we've just been consistent. And I think there's been a ton of stuff that's flowed through uh, TIS, we've built this Discord on purpose. The plan was to grow it. The plan was to grow the Discord from the beginning. Not just to have a station where we organize, not just to have a Discord where we organize. The plan was, and I can thank Caleb Aranya for, for that insight, was like, Discord is important. It's going to be a big thing. 
you want to use it to bring in callers, right? Like, so the crowd that was watching the show could come in and be a participant, you know, like, hey, caller, let's have you on the air. And then you just drag them into the right channel in Discord. They give their question. You move them out of the channel and you answer their question. And we really wanted that kind of interactivity with the, um, with the people out there uh, that were watching. So that was the plan with Discord, was to create an audience that you could participate with. And that's what, um, what we were really after, was that kind of stuff. And, but what it allowed us to do was something that was unexpected. And that was to build a holding community, uh, much like uh, Reddit, actually, where people check in. They want to check in on what's going on, what's the news. And we could do another 10, 15 minutes on what that actually means in EVE Online, because the, the, the history of technology and communication is a big part of these MMO communities. Uh, but we won't go into that. Suffice to say that people that want to know more about EVE Online will eventually get told, well, there's, th there's something more for you on Reddit because that's where people post stuff. Um, some in the forums, but a lot on Reddit. So there's definitely been this transition. And that's where we ended up. We ended up building, and it was hard, but we're over 3,000 people in TIS Discord. At certain points, we really put a lot of activity into it, or I do, and I get into public chat, and I sit there until people come and talk to me, and three or four people start talking to me, and then other people will see that there's a discussion going on, and they'll jump in, and it grows sometimes to 10, 20 people, but uh, most of the time, it's just a few people that are regulars. And that's really how, how um, TIS has grown organically, um, the plan was to interact with the community and the fans and to, to have them participate, but that's grown into a little bit of a holding community where TIS has basically become a place that you can hang out with and um, keep up on news. It's real time. You can ask your questions and you can get your information. And it's, We've grown into multiple channels for different uh, languages. We uh, put a lot of extra channels that you can't see unless you opt into those. Those are called select channels. So if you want to talk about real life, you can. But one of the things that Talking Stations has always been about is politics, real life politics. Yes, we talk about that. And it's because we all know each other and like each other that we've been here you know, five years, four years, that we can discuss politics. It's okay. We can do it. We're adults. Uh, and I'm maybe the worst offender, you know, with the, you know, Molotov cocktails every once in a while. But other people in there are just so smart that I can't get away with it. So I can make some broad statement and people will just immediately cut me down. <laughs> That's how it works. And the channel works because it's small and not everybody's in it. And there's no bomb, you know, there's very little bomb throwing. Bomb throwers get escorted out pretty quick. They don't get escorted out. Let me make that clear. They figure out, they feel out the room and it's not. It's not up for just garbage. So behind the scenes, politics, real life politics channel is actually like a breaking news channel. And I find out about my news through that channel. Like people in that channel put up news before it hits the actual internet. So it's, it's fantastic for that. And I do not encourage you to go to the politics in real life channel unless you're going to behave like an adult because you will feel that the room is very protective of itself. Even from me. So here's this Discord. We've built an EVE community. We have in real life politics. We have in real life channels for space, for humor, for, uh, you know, fan fest meetups. And we um, don't know what to do with it. We have Talking in Stations, this podcast that comes out to you every week. Um, first, it was on a Friday night. Sorry, it was, yeah, on a Friday night. Then it moved to a Saturday morning briefly. And then we moved it to a Sunday morning where it's um, existed ever since. And funny thing about that, it started out on a Friday night because I could stay late at work and not tell my wife that I was developing a show. And it did, I did that for a year before I just felt too dishonest to go on. But literally, she had no idea I was doing this. And, uh, Finally, she was just like, every Friday night, you have to work late. Like, we should be able to go out. And I was like, oh, I can't keep this up. I got to do something. So then I thought, I'll, 
I'll move talking stations to European time zone. I'll wake up at five in the morning and I'll do it before she wakes up. <laughs> that's how dishonest I was thinking. <laughs> like that's how I can get away with it. Um, or I need to pass it off to other people to do. And when I did do that, it died pretty quickly. Like we, we could see that we were riding high at about 20, 1200 listeners. Like we'd built up to about 1200 listeners. At first it was like three to 600 listeners right off the bat. Cause I had a lot of clout coming out of, uh, both EN 24 and INN gave me a lot of news clout and we built up to about 600 listeners and quickly, but getting to 800 was a, took months and then getting 800 to 1200 took months and months and months. And so that's kind of a very slow progression in stages. Um, so I thought I need to like let other people do the show because then I don't have to be so dishonest in my real life. And then it turns out that um, when other people would do the show, it, it would, the, the, the viewership would just start to slowly tank and then I would come back on and it would take three episodes to come back up. And I left like four times and every single time we could just track, they went back up. You know, uh, and uh, Captain Pugwash there the, says uh, he or she watched them all, watched all the talking in stations. And I want to tell you how many you've seen. And this is just talking in stations, standard shows on a Sunday, basically, or the standard flagship show, we'll call it, there have been, up to now, 200 episodes of Talking in Stations. So you've watched 200 of them. In addition to that 200 is 53 midweek reports where we stood up a second show in the middle because we, we could see that people would tune in and devour Talking in Stations two days, three days later, and they would, so the hump, and then it would just kind of die down. Like everybody was caught up after two or three days. And I thought, well, we need to stick a show right at the end of that two or three days. So that some update, right? Just like, Hey, a lot of stuff's happened in the week. We can't cover it all in one day. So let's put a show right there in the middle to kind of get us over to the next Sunday so that we, we have two bumps, right? So we give somebody some, some time in there. And uh, so that's when those 53 now shows um, started. And that was pretty much, that was actually only a year ago. God, that's, uh, that's not that long. Hello, Nick. Yes. Uh, so let me see. I'll just read this out loud without actually knowing what I'm reading here. Simple answer to the viewership, folk like you ask questions and actually listen to the replies and keep the conversation going without being overly biased or critical. And uh, I think that works. And I don't know exactly how he means it, but I do think it works both ways in that the audience is a big part of the talking in stations show because we have the immediacy of getting more information and being more correct in our assessment, but we have to come in with an initial assessment. Otherwise, if nobody's participating in the audience, that you're not just sitting there with no information. Uh, but it's definitely a cycle. Okay, so here we are with now 200 talking stations shows, 50 midweek report shows, and we have other shows like, um, uh, well, I won't get into other shows yet because then I would bring in Lichgrave, and I just want to finish this gigantic monologue. <laughs> but we have this, this, sh these group of shows, and we don't know like what, what they are. We still don't know what they are. I think I do now. Um, but it's, I would say it's very much like a, a music band, right? Like you start a band and you, you feel some success. People show up to your gigs. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not for nothing. You realize it's not for nothing that people will show up. Uh, they are, there are fans, but you don't know what it is and you don't know how to make it better and you don't you don't really know how to move forward so you keep doing the same thing and just growing the statistics right like we went from like i said 600 to 800 listeners to 1200 listeners and then we went to 1600 listeners for a long time 
and then we went all the way up to 2,300 subscribers. Those are average subscribers to the podcast. And that was a big number, 2,300. Because if you add in the YouTube and you add in the Twitch and you add in the uh, uh, VODs and just uh, from, from recording to the end of its lifespan, that was an average between of 2019 of 6,500. That's where we peaked. 6,500 listeners. Sorry, that's listens. That's average listens. That's not even... Yes, that's, is that average listens? I think it is, yeah. And we had some peaks in there, right? Like when Hilmar gave us the blackout interview, we treated that special and that was completely by accident. But we wanted to give something special to the uh, listener. So when Hilmar said, I want to do an interview, I want to do it on your show, we said, we're happy to do it. It's intimidating. We're happy to do it. We'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do it in the middle of the week. We'll record it. We'll give it to our podcast listeners since they're the ones that are most of our, they're the mass, they're the bulk of our fans, the people who listen to the podcast. We're going to give it to them first and then we'll release it pre-recorded on Sunday to the live audience because the live audience is actually the very, they're the small part of the, they're like, they're like 5%. Uh, so we want to do something special for our podcast listeners. So anytime we do like a big interview, we're going to give it to them first. And that was the first time we did that. Well, I don't know if it worked or not because it's an outlier interview anyway. It, it was a, an important interview with an important person at the center of something that was unknowable by the Eve community. It was an important interview. And we got criticized a little bit for it by people who were, I think, jealous that we got the interview. But... That interview did 18,000 impressions. That's 18,000 listens for that blackout interview from Hilmar. Yeah, so it was a big, big deal. Ashtarathi, come in here if you want. So, so anyway, we're at like 6,500. We have a big viewership. We have 3,000 people in Discord. By all measures, we're looking at something that looks like a success. We have a river of information going through our pu uh, public channel. And we're having to figure out, like, how do we accommodate more participation? How do, uh, I've been trying for two or three years now to make it about a group rather than about me. And, and, and the problem with that is that the group has to, like, participate. And... That hasn't been calibrated right. So some people will participate for a while and then kind of get quiet. And some people will um, never participate at all. But they're important people. But you don't, you know, so there's all that kind of stuff. But there are certain people uh, that are just deliverers of great content all the time. Hey, Ash, how's it going? Boy, just in time, right? You came in right on cue. <laughs> And then there's Ash. And then there's Ash. Yeah. No. Well, I guess I'm done here, guys. I'll catch you all later. I'll just step back. No, 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 no. You can tend the fire like last time. I do. <laughs> I do want to point out that one of the <laughs> one of the staples of talking in stations, as long as I'm on this topic, and I did not expect to go on this long about it, but it might as well be our reintroduction with this. One of the staples of talking in stations, it's behind the scenes, and there are more than a few is oh great we just got raided thanks wow. for that raid that's nice i know that name i should know who that is yeah it's urschlag that's urschlag yes he, he plays um on the opposite time line time schedule is what we usually do but he does a lot of abyss stuff okay yeah he's a really good pilot i think he, we... does, he does the will it blend series oh yeah that's right he takes like ships that by no means should be in the abyss and then clears the abyss with them. Spoiler yeah. alert, it blends. <laughs> All right, so just to finish up this whole area, God, I'm sorry I'm dominating. We will move into news in just a second. I'll even do a reintroduction just so we can do this uh, properly. Let me actually flip on something for people to look at. Well, actually, I'll do it in a second. Um, so we've got this thing, Discord's big. We've got uh, this juggernaut of a machine that's going. We've tried different things. We try to make it live news. Um, 
uh, in other words, we give channels to players. In fact, at one point we were like, if you want to start up a channel, we'll make you the moderator of it. Just let us know. Nobody took us up on it. Otherwise they could have had their own topics channel and stuff. But now we have a lot of real life channels that are going that are, that are populated enough to keep people posting in there. And we have a, a public that can sometimes just go nuts with thousands of messages. Sometimes it's a lot less. It just depends on what's going on in the game. So with all that um, inertia, the question is like, how do you, how do you give that to more people? And um, how do you make that uh, something that can survive when you're not around, basically? Otherwise, it's a lot of pressure. And that's what we've been struggling with for like a year. And so I'll just make these announcements and then I'll open it up to my friends here. Hello, Roliat. And that is that, uh, no, I'm not announcing that Talking in Stations is closing. <laughs> no. But I am announcing that Talking in Stations is going to change. And it's going to change. It was supposed to change uh, January 1st, but... Instead, it's changing uh, through January and probably through February because we want slow rolling changes instead of abrupt new idea. Let's go in that direction because you lose you lose that inertia. So what we're going to do is talking in stations is going to stay the name and it's now a network. I'll explain that in a second. And this Sunday's show is actually just going to be the report. So it's talking in stations report. And the midweek show essentially stays the same. It's talking in stations update in the middle of the week. So you have a report on Sunday and you have an update in the middle of the week. And then we are inviting uh, other people to create shows. And what we've managed to do, and this is what I've been doing for the last month, which is why I haven't been around, is create podcasts for different people that feed into a general talking in stations uh, RSS feed. So as a listener, you won't need to, um, as listeners, they won't need to change anything. They will get all the content. And for people who say like Pandos, Pandorolica from the initiative does FC chats, right? And we take the audio and we cut it and put it in, clean it up, put it out just so he can get more exposure. He doesn't pay us. We don't pay him. It's a total friendly relationship. He's not part of TIS. He has to complete independence, do whatever he wants, but he gives it to us because he knows that we have an audience. But if you only want to listen to that, we can produce the podcast now for just that. But it also is part of the Talking in Stations network, so it will go through the major feed. If you only want to listen to Talking in Stations proper, like you don't want all this other stuff that's coming in, like interviews on the side and stuff like that, then you can just subscribe to that. So we're going to have multiple podcasts, but they will all feed the one major RSS feed, which is talking in stations. So talking in stations becomes from this, from going forward this month, it becomes a place for many voices, not just mine, not just my direction, etc. It's a place of many voices from Eve online. It literally is talking in stations because when we envisioned this it was a, a space bar with pilots from all over the cluster and this is a waypoint that only the most experienced pilots know about and they all kind of stop in at the station on their way to somewhere else and they trade information on what's out there and that's what talking in stations is it's a nerve center of multiple pilots from multiple different play styles talking about what's going on in the cluster. And all that gets exchanged in this bar, in this station, and uh, so far. And so, yes, a uh, question is, Nick says, are you going to have your Matterall specific channel? Again, everything is going through talking in stations because it's a multitude of voices, but I will start doing a lot of short form interviews. Um, sorry, we'll do short form stuff, which will be explainers, but I'm going to actually return to doing interviews like I did with the Matani and the boat. I'm going to interview, hopefully, uh, people like, uh, and I have interviewed, but I'm just now going to start letting you guys hear these interviews, but people like, Famous people, but also not so famous people. But we'll have Gobbins, 
Maybe I can get Gig X. I'll talk to Eep from I Want Isk, see what he's been up to. These interviews, hopefully, these types of interviews will start coming through. They won't be shows. They'll be Matterall 101 interviews with uh, a person. And so those are the kinds of things you can look forward to. Also, clearly, we have offerings that are still going to be coming through here, like how to make ISK in EVE Online. Anytime Ashtarothy wants to put something out, he has a platform to do it. Anytime Pando puts something out, he has a platform to do it. If Vili wants to do a show, we're going we're gonna to put it out. So that's how we're going to go forward. You're going to get a ton more content. And all that Solo. is possible because we have someone uh, like Artemis and January and, uh, and I'm finishing up right here, uh, of course, McLeod. These are like pillars of talking in stations that do a lot of the technical work that you don't see. Uh, and then you do see other pillars like Elise and uh, uh, Carneros who do a lot of the content development, Silver Suspuria. And I'm going to stop naming people because it's going to get really insulting for people that I don't name. But do you see some people in front? You see other people that are not visible to you that are doing a lot of the work. And because of them, we can do this sort of a thing. And so that's where we're going to go. So let me see if I can understand or if I can, if I understand what you're saying. So there's going to be multiple podcasts and each podcast could be subscribed to individually. And then there's going to be a meta RSS feed that basically is all of those subscriptions combined. So you can either subscribe to individual podcasts for that inform or that flavor, or that information or that, that type of content, or you can subscribe and, or you can subscribe to the master feed and just get everything. That's exactly right. Awesome. Yeah. But I think the emphasis is going to be on lower expectations, <laughs> more content. We're going to make it a living conversation, right? We want this to be a river of uh, content, but it's got to be good. It's got to be, and this is not a good example of it, concise. It's got to be focused on what we know, not so much what we think. Um, that's just all the sensibilities that I, I focus on and have focused on for years. They're going to be funneled through that. So it's not going to be just anybody who wants to talk about anything. But we want to get nuts and bolts. We want to talk about stuff at a high level for advanced players and stuff at a broad level for players who want to become advanced players. That's what we'll do. Yeah, there's a Funky Bacon. I'll try to look him up. Uh, clearly, I'll talk to a, a, someone I consider an online friend, uh, Andrew Groen. We'll get some old timers. Like, I really want to explore Eve not just the news and what's going on today, but I want to start giving you some of that retro feel of like generations past. Where are they now? Um, what is a real player doing uh, these days? You know, whether they're gone or not. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what we're going forward. It's going to become a much bigger, much bigger offering. And it really is only possible because we're motivated to do it. And I'm going to be honest about this. Whenever, and all you know this because you're all players of EVE Online, that you have to be motivated by something. Either you're seeing your kill board get bigger, you're seeing your kill efficiency go up, you're seeing your skills go up, you're seeing your uh, capabilities as a pilot go up, um, you finally got that level 5 Logi, whatever. You have to track a progress and feel like you're getting better because if you're not, you lose interest. So to keep our interest, we've been looking at this Discord grow. Again, over 3,000 people now. We've been looking at our, uh, su our subscribers grow that are listening to the show. We've been watching our sessions grow on, uh, on stream. Uh, actually, we've seen those diminish, right? Because a lot of people are getting their news uh, after the fact or whenever it's convenient on YouTube. But we've seen YouTube grow whenever we're consistent. But well, that's what keeps us motivated. One of the main things that we see is we look at our Patreons to see income. Uh, are we getting income to give us flexibility to do stuff? Income paid for people going to e Vegas and reporting from there. Uh, in income will pay for people going to e FanFest to report from there to get you that sort of stuff. Um, I'm happy to report to you guys that we've been at this for four years 
and three out of the four years, uh, the fourth being just wrapped up, I'll talk about that in a second, but the three out of the four years, we've ended up uh, at zero, right? So no profit or zero <laughs> or below profit, but only like 60 bucks. So I lost like 60 bucks, I think last year. Um, and then this year I haven't calculated, we're probably gonna end up above zero. Um, but the profit isn't just like going into my pocket. The profit is being spent back into all the stuff that makes the show happen and to incentivize uh, some people here and there, uh, but also to buy all the software experimentation we do because we do a lot of experimentation trying to figure out how we can run the place a bit better and all that sort of thing. So Patreon supporters have made Talking and Stations possible. That's the reason that we've been able to survive as long as we have. So think about becoming a Patreon. If you like this stuff, throw five bucks a month at it or more if you're one of those guys that this is your hobby, this is your thing, and, uh, and you feel like Talking in Stations is bringing you the stuff you want to listen to. Because we can talk about anything and we can make it incredibly boring, or we can talk about EVE Online and try to thrill you with some of the stuff that is incredible. Unfortunately, we can't talk about the real life stuff that makes it even more interesting. But you know, we, we'll bring you as much as we can without crossing lines to, to thrill you about what's going on in EVE Online. Anyway, nobody does that better than Ashtarothi for, for me. Gets me excited about all kinds of content that I'm not even aware of. All right, that's the end of it. Uh, that's not the end of the show, but that is the end of that presentation I wanted to talk about. We're going to do a transition. You can see we have a new logo up there. And I am going to now be quiet and let Ash and Lich, Grave and Roliat tell me some stuff. Uh, emerging conduits died. They nerfed them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty, like, it pretty much turned off, as Ash was saying yesterday on a stream. Pretty, I, like, I have a without theory. directly turning them off, they're worthless. They are currently, they're they currently on... on they are currently not in a good place. Let's not say that they turned them off or they nerfed them or whatever. Okay. Let's just say that they're currently well, not okay. in a good place. Wait, Mechanic let's go back. Let's go back and from. Let's go from, back. Hold on a second. Okay. Let, sorry, I don't want to moderate, but I, I do want to just for people who don't understand like me, tell me where we began with conduits. I know they were hot, and where they're at now. Right. So, <clears throat> first of all, what are emerging conduits? Emerging conduits are a new kind of anomaly that only spawns in high security space and started spawning shortly after, about two or three months after the introduction of invasions, uh, around the time that the Rasnaborg showed up. So uh, these sites spawn in, this, in certain systems, and they function just like minor conduits. So they have their they're surrounded by a ring of rocks. There's a hole that opens. There's three spawns of uh, three waves of spawns. In this case, it can be taken out by most, uh, you know, battle cruisers. Uh, command ships are particularly good at it. Rattlesnake, um, Vindicator, these kinds of ships are very, very good at soloing them. And when they're completed, the next site spawns in the same system after one minute, or at least that's how it used to be. So you could just roll these things over and over and over again. And people would make some very good money. Um, very good. And some people made extremely good money uh, out of these things um, based on whatever equipment they are. And people really refined it and min-maxed it to get it down from... We, we started out with like a 14-minute average being okay, and people were starting to scrape at six-minute averages um, wow. by the time... Uh, or right now. So... Uh, the problem is, is that they started becoming more and more popular, and over time, it kind of became a solved problem, and then the bots started. Oh, and no. And so it, it basically became a runaway problem. And so now they made a tr change so that way, instead of being in one minute, it now takes 10 minutes for it to respawn. And the loot that drops has been significantly reduced. We don't I'm not going to put any numbers on anything because it's all just like reports and not very many. And since people aren't running them as much, we're not getting as much data. But it seems as if the the loot that drops has been reduced significantly. Um, but yeah, once every 10 minutes now instead of once every minute, which basically means you can't roll them in the way that you used to at all. Um, it also means that more of the value of it comes out of the actual payout. 
And I have seen rumors, although I haven't tested it myself, that they actually might be a little bit easier than they used to be. Which brings me to my theory, which is that I think that now you're supposed to be in like two or three cruisers or maybe battle cruisers and kind of roam around and hit them as you go, perhaps while doing combat exploration or something else. Um, otherwise, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it, otherwise they're just pretty much off fu functionally. Wow. If you want to go they're into more off. detail about these sites and more of the uh, invasion sites, you can check out episode two of Matt Isk and shameless plug. Matt Isk, because that's where you, uh, you talk about these things. Yeah, we had, me and Ash did an entire episode on emergings and minors and majors. For more details, look there. But obviously, these are the updates that we had mentioned in the episode. You know, we never, gonna be coming. we never put those out as a podcast. They were always just a YouTube video. Uh, we should cut them up and put them out. Gonna write that down. <laughs> Lichgrave will remember this. <laughs> will I? No. I don't know. Uh, I'm looking at a screenshot of what um, what conduits look like so that you guys can see what we were talking about. But I did not know they got nerfed into the ground. There is a lot to talk about since woof, the last time um, we met on a daily basis here. But um, something that just happened last night was a big fight between... Um, um, NCPL uh, Horde and also their other ally now Fraternity You, we together we call them PandaFam it used to be PanFam which was short for Pandemic Family right with NCPL and Horde and now with Fraternity it's called PandaFam uh, so they attack Dead Coalition in the north uh, and in the staging for staging system for um, Ranger Regiment, which is one of the bigger groups inside uh, of that. So the um, uh, the big battle happened yesterday, and it looked like there was a huge armada. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny because it was... Um, I'll go actually to, to bring you this message. We have... Uh, an image that I want to take you to. By the way, we have a Talking in Stations Reddit now. Talking in Stations. And the Reddit is used it's as a kind of like the Eve subreddit, but not awful. <laughs> We're not trying to compete with Reddit. Let's be clear about that. So we don't want you coming here and posting a bunch of stuff. Um, but what we what we do want is to kind of take the best of Reddit, move it over through cross-posting. And so inside of Talking in Stations Reddit, you'll see uh, in the future, you'll see more and more of this. You'll see stuff that we consider interesting news. It won't have the comments here. They'll direct you to Reddit where you can read the comments there, which is, you know, a big part of Reddit is the comments. That's where you get the added information. But what this does allows us to kind of curate what we consider news. This will inform our shows, and this also feeds right into Discord, so people can to, can get uh, the news in Discord and go, again, to the actual source, not to necessarily to us. We're not trying to replace Reddit. We're trying to curate it. Um, but what you'll see here is something that I put in here yesterday, and it is... I don't know if I can zoom in on that. Thanks, Nick. Hey, thanks, Nick, for subscribing. But this is uh, Northern Coalition basically saying, hey, it's Chinese New Year. That was last night, right? And we have this big fight that's going to happen. It happened about, uh, what, seven hours ago. It's important. You need to be there. This is the most important thing we've done in a while. And to make sure that you are incentivized to show up, we're going to give away <clears throat> a super carrier. And then a different FC says, and I'm going to give away a super carrier too. And then I think probably Lady Scarlet says, well, I'm going to give away a super carrier too. So there's three super carriers that are going to be given away to fleet members. And then, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know who did this, but a Zenitra is going to be given away or was given away last night, seven hours ago. And so there's this big party basically of giving away these big ships. Uh, if you showed up to this big fight that was going to happen between PandaFam 
and Dead Coalition. And they were going to be fighting over the iHub, which is the important fight in a system. Um, for the staging area, a Ranger Regiment, which are uh, Dead Coalition's, one of their bigger co uh, alliances. Um, they're Chinese, basically. So what this led to was a pretty good showing for Northern Coalition for them to be able to put, and they did put 140 to 160 Titans in Chinese time zone on the map. To put that much hardware on the map with subcap fleets and that sort of stuff is impressive. That is a high watermark for NC Dot, a European alliance, essentially. Uh, so to be able to do that shows a really strong presence in the very, very coveted Chinese-Australian time zone, which is usually dead of night for most players. Even so, somehow, I think a sigil managed to capture a node for the iHub that totally unplugged their efforts to destroy it. Uh, so Hero Sigil, apparently, manages to do a clutch play, capture a node, and win the day for Dead Coalition. So the staging ground was defended because the iHub was defended by this sigil who did a clutch play and got it done there at the last second. Uh, so <clears throat> that was a that was a good that was a good and interesting moment there. You have a really strong showing from Pan to Fam, but the objective goes to the defending Dead Coalition this time around. The question is, what's next? Is this a turning point? And I think that remains to be seen. So there is definitely activity in the north. We'll get into more details Sunday. Uh, but wanted to get you caught up on what happened just about seven hours ago. We're thinking of taking it live, but I'm not going to do a uh, three in the morning live cast unless I'm 100% sure there's going to be a big fight that happens. All right, so that was kind of interesting. And again, showing you Talking In Stations on Reddit. That's r slash Talking In Stations, created by Astarathi. Thank you very much. Um is a place where we will post news as we get it. That is where we will put our news. We've tried a bunch of things, but this is now where we're going to put our news, and that's going to feed right into Discord, into this channel called Eve News at the very top. So that feed will keep you informed throughout the day because we're in an era now of news rivers, essentially. And so... It's hard to know what happened 10 minutes ago if you come in at the wrong time. So what we'll do is we'll just put all our stuff there and try to capture off the river as many important things as we can. So conduits are nerfed. NC big fight uh, against Dead Coalition. Uh, we'll see what happens there. What else do we have in this new expansion that came out, guys? Nirvana implants. This is interesting to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Shield slaves. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, shield slaves arrived, but they arrived in a distorted fashion because people put up theoretical bills that you could do with shield slaves, right? Shield slaves are plugins you put into your character that augment the power of your ship if it's a shield based ship. And if you are flying that ship, a certain way and you fit it a certain way, you're getting astounding um, basically hit points. And uh, I don't know if they are going to let that go for a while. Are they going to let that distortion go for a while? Or do you think they're going to clamp down on that? Well, okay. Let's, let's take a step back okay. and kind of look at the whole problem because there's a reason why these are such a special snowflake compared to everything else. And it's also a reason why these have taken so long to come out. So shields are not like armor insofar as shields recharge over time, right? And the, the way that shield recharge works is that a shield has a recharge time and a total amount. And the recharge time is the amount of time to go from zero shields to full shields, which means the more your shields is, the more hit points your shields have, the faster, the more hit points per second you will recharge 
So increasing your shield hit points also increases your, your passive resi uh, rep, okay? So uh, there's also a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of disagreement about how shield recharge works, um, especially under tie dye, which has caused a lot of concern. Um, and I think I'll get back to that in a minute. So there is a previous implant that was known as slaves, um, which give you plus to hit points, uh, armor hit points. Um, and uh, earlier this year, or sorry, earlier last year, um, CCP Fozzie changed those from, uh, and his team, changed it from uh, slaves that were drop dropped by Sancha to amulets that are dropped by blood raiders. And this was supposed to be part of a larger implant change that included the, the release of this implant set that had been promised for years and never released, which was known as shield slaves. In other words, the shield version of, uh, of the slave implant. And now that amulets were out of the way, now Sancha could have the shield slave implant because she, uh, Sancha's sh shields anyways. Got it. So um, now shield slaves have been released. They are, na they are actually called Nirvana implants. Uh, they are Sancha, although they're technically the Momoksha chorus, but that's a totally different story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the issue here is that for years... There was a lot of humming and hawing about the creation of these implants, that there was so much that had to be done to make this balance because just giving shields a whole bunch more hit points on top of the, like the buffer rattlers that already exist or shield supers that already exist, giving them 50% additional hit points on top of all of that would break a lot of things. And so this, this was something that they could never quite make work without some major tanking overhaul. And there was supposed to be a major tanking overhaul as part of all of this. Uh, uh, a rebalancing of how passive recharge wor uh, modules work. Um, but now we got none of that and only the sh the, this new implant. Um, and its full ramifications haven't has still not been totally realized, but um, the, they did not correct anything or balance anything around it or anything like that. So they're just out there now. And so shield supers and shield, uh, you know, uh, passive shield ships who can get their hands on these implants, and they are quite expensive because of how they are acquired, but those who can acquire them uh, are going to have really, really high hit points and really good shield recharge. Now, the one confusion that, that kind of depends on whether or not how angsty you are about this is that the player base believes passionately that shield recharge is not affected by tie-dye. In other words, if tie-dye slows down time, shields continue to recharge in a real-time state, which, which means that shields could, could technically have their recharge amplified by, uh, by tenfold under full tie-dye, which would be incredibly powerful and one of the things that uh, people cite as the reason why shield supers are able to be uh, survive over armor. Um, however, CCP this week has come out and outright said that that is not true. That shield recharge is uh, done uh, is slowed down with tie dye, and several people in the thread argued back. So that's where we're at on that one. Um, so shield, uh, shield slaves, i.e. Nirvana implants, are out. They're very hard to get. They require running a pretty dangerous low-sec site that, that has very uh, strict uh, ship restrictions and has a low drop rate of these implants. Um, so they're extremely expensive, 10 bill plus for a set. Um, there's low, media, mid, and, and high, and they may or may not be breaking the game. Well, that answers a lot and nothing. So we don't know what's in the future, but thanks for that explanation. 
just think about you not even just the Titans, think about the Moonins that were just recently nerfed. Now they're tankier if people still consider to use them. Right. And I think that that's one of the reasons why they're released the way that they are, because now they exist in the game. The game can kind of process them, but there's not enough of them. Like, they're so expensive that you're not going to use them in, like, a doctrine or anything like that. You're going to see them here or there and maybe a couple of extreme examples um, for them to be able to balance for. That was voice of uh, Tyrat Van Vankel. You... Vanchel, it's okay. Vanchel, Vanchel, Ty Trat, Vanchel. How do you say your name? Tyrat Vanchel. Tyrat Vanchel. Not that difficult. It's all good. You're from... Tell us about yourself. Well, currently I'm in Pirate. Pirate. Right. Everybody hates... It probably hates me already. I, I've heard Pirate, Pirate is incredibly know, effective. Like, incredibly effective. Like, if you hire Pirate as a mercenary group, they get the job done, is what I've heard. I'm not going to say it? it's not true. That's, I mean, you can <laughs> check killboards and everything, but um, if you do want to pay or just, I don't really want to plug, but just send uh, send Natural or Clone Killer or Chromius a mail if you're interested in services. But I'm more, me personally, with the Shield Slayers, like, everything is just all subcaps as well like i already use uh whatever the armor ones are now called constantly so now i can do that with shields it's just it's insane yeah um the passive gila actually all you know the passive gila and the passive rattlesnake um if you can use these if you like i said if you can get your hands on these they're really really strong um <laughs> Isn't this exactly why it took so long? CCP said, yes. look, we want to give them to you, but they're difficult to balance on. And if we put them out there, we may have unintended consequences. Right. And they, so for they said years, that two years ago, right? More than two years. Like, probably at least as long as I've been playing, I've heard about Shield Slaves and the ideas behind it. Um, so the fact that they would just, like, put it out there it does make me kind of look back at it all and go, well, what was, why did we wait so long then? Like, what was the point of all of that, you know, angst and, and hand wringing about it if we're just going to release it? But I don't know, man. We're yeah, going to have to what, see where they got, what they got coming next. Well, we're in a situation since I think summer. It's called the chaos era inside of EVE Online. People cringe. Uh, some people cringe because they're afraid of that word. Other people embrace it and lament that it's not, uh, proper blackout chaos era, but we are still in and will be for a while an era of chaos where things are thrown out at players without them knowing what's coming and they have to, they're hit with it and they have to adapt. I think it works both ways. CCP is throwing things at players with unexpected results and CCP has to deal with that chaos as well and react and adjust and that's their plan is to iterate constantly and keep you off balance but also to make it interesting but also make it make sense yeah so i liken it to when uh like you've just taken a major loss in like a big fleet or whatever and uh, all the people that are in charge of dealing with the fleets get together and like talk about how to fix the problem and you know maybe for the first 20 minutes or so you are coming up with effective strategies and, and, and to deal with the actual problem. But after a certain point, you've, you've now chased your tail so far that you're just countering yourself, right? Like, oh, but then they could bring this. And like, you know, you're, you're dealing with like imaginary scenarios that may or may not happen. And that causes you to reject plans and strategies that could be highly effective in the practical. So I see CCP as functioning like this for most of their existence in the fact that uh, we have frequently talked about what would happen if a change um, occurs in EVE in a very pearl-clutching, uh, a very conservative uh, attitude in the fact that like all change is bad as kind of a <laughs> core, core premise uh, of the community. 
um, that we hear a lot. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that most of the time feedback is heard from, you know, the, the loud, angry minority. Well, people with an but, interest. Right, right, right. Um, but what this has caused is CCP to uh, not do a lot of things for fear that it might cause a problem. And I think that the new strategy is just they're able to iterate now fast enough that they say, well, instead of being worried about what kind of problem it is and over designing it and then just never doing anything, let's just, you know, put it out there, watch what does well, watch what breaks and then fix what breaks. You know, there's a there's a development philosophy called fail faster where you just instead of trying to design it forever you just put it out there see what's wrong and then make it okay you know and then make it good you know mm -hmm. um as we've seen in the past they can they can design and perfect and polish something for months and then put it out and it'd still be crap so they might as well just put it out there see what happens and adjust as necessary right think think of uh in in terms of that that an example of that would be uh, the uh, Satoyos, right? They have this new AI. They want to put it out. They put some work into it. They put it out and it's defeated within three days. And it's like the flag, the flag post of that, you know, summer. That's, that was a humiliating moment for them to put so much work into something that was defeated by players, figured out and can be gamed by players within a few days or weeks. Because that content was supposed to be difficult and keep them busy for a long time. So I think the natural result to that is like, let's put it out there. Let's admit that it could be broken and then fix it while players are off, you know, trying to figure out how it's working and just, we'll just um, fight this out with the players in real time in the server instead of in a test theoretical environment. Speaking of test environments, can I just say how frustrated we all are that Sissy is still down? Like it's been down for almost a month now. And they put out the, they put out a thing that said, you know, like they let us know it's going to be down indefinite or you know for a while. Mm -hmm. And I get that there's probably some technical thing that they're testing. They're doing some stuff uh, that makes me think that they're working on something pretty meaty um, on on the technical side, not like on a feature side. Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes sense. But it's still super frustrating because like we need to do things like cap training and other kinds of training and stuff like that that is just really bad idea to do live so <laughs> um i want my well sissy back. i think that's interesting because uh, and i did this too when i first got a capital ship i was a bit nervous about jumping so i used an environment that was a test environment same game test environment nothing counts to make errors to learn how to do it and to build some confidence there and i wonder if if it's not part of the plan to make to make that risk part of the game, like you have to be a youngling in EVE Online where things actually count, where you can be eaten by a tiger. Uh, so that's part of the... I think that's an interesting byproduct of closing CC. Now well, they haven't closed it. I mean, it's just... It, it's not like done. shuttered. Mm-hmm. It's just they they said it won't. It's or, going to be in vi VIP mo mode until further notice. Oh, so it's not closed. It's just closed off. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like I think mm. that it's just like uh, either they're working on something that's like like the scaffolding is showing, so they don't want to let us in, um, or uh, like it's a technical issue where like the, there's going to be a client change, and so since we don't have, the, we don't they don't. It's a long story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, also, they don't want to send us a new sissy client because anytime they send us a new sissy client with assets, we can see in there and and do what we want. So, yeah, and I do like what Dusty says that we he, he and I are on the same page here. CC should not be used as a place to learn the game, in my opinion. And uh, Inkmar uh, Duas uh, agrees with him. So these two guys are saying. Um, that you should learn inside the game where you're vulnerable. That's part of the process. It's part of the exhilaration, et cetera, et cetera. Can't come in at 100%. I mean, confident. I don't disagree. And if they do shutter Sissy, then I could accept that completely. But um, I would say that on Sissy's website, it says, or on the website for Singularity, it says that it is for both um, the 
uh, CCP and the player's testing purposes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know what this, what this reminds me of Ash is the, is the unintended consequences of E of CCP's actions, right? Like they put out this blackout last summer and in that time, people were like, oh, big deal. It's just going to make uh, the people who have big power uh, or a security situation more powerful. And the people who are uh, don't have a security apparatus uh, and communications for that sort of a thing, they're going to be the ones that are more vulnerable. So you are hurting the little guy, not the big groups. So this is not a big deal to us. And then right, a right after that case is made, before blackout hits, uh, well, uh, is it Squiz? Squiz? Squiz, who owns um, the kill boards for EVE Online that people refer to, Z Kill. He says, you know what? I'm shutting Z Kill board down. And Walry, uh, the developer for Dotland, is shutting his uh, website down. We're both shutting those sites down uh, in to honor this blackout. And for the most part, what the players shut down was a lot more damaging than what CCP shut down in the game. So this whole thing about um, developing knowledge in a safe environment, whether you're working on a test server and developing knowledge there, learning how to be safe, um, or you're looking at real-time information and learning how to be safe through looking at Dotland or looking through Zkill, like when those things are no longer available to you as a player, I think your ability to play EVE Online is changed. And it's changed with a higher risk. And I think that created some interesting results. I, so... Unintended I'll results. You, I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, this is one of the things that made me kind of not like NullSec too much right, uh, like right now. Because um, as a scout... One of the things that I have always wanted to do, the niche I'd wa I've wanted to play, is intelligence gathering. Um, and with so much information, when when blackout hit, and when some of the other stuff was being threatened, um, that to me is extremely interesting because that means that somebody has to go do it now, right? You don't just get to rely on a machine that's watching everything to report to you. If anything happens, uh, you have to have eyes on and that got me really excited. Although I know that everybody's just going to do alts or whatever, but that doesn't matter. I like one of the very first things that I did when I got to NullSec was I sat on the gate to our little, uh, entrance and I, and I reported literally every single thing that went through. Um, that, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, besides blues, yeah. uh, you know, for like six or seven hours, um, that's the kind of thing that I've always loved to do, but like over time that has become less valuable to those people. So, yeah. Oh, well. And that's a really good point of entry for participation from people who are new to NullSec. Like, Hey, I don't know what to do. I'm out here. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I can't really move around a lot, um, on my own. I certainly can't hunt on my own. So what do I do? Hey man, why don't you just go over to that area and just give intel? And that was a simple thing to do, and it was exciting because you were you were kind of cloaked and spying on a gate as people came through. You would light it up on the um, intel channels, and people would thank you for that information because it was valuable at the time. And all that's been automated away, so now you have a lot less entry points for people uh, to do a job that doesn't. Uh, that, that you could do without all the tension of an actual fleet where people's lives are on the line. Like it's really, it was a nice way to ease into NullSec. Totally agree. Well, I had a bunch more to say on that, but I, I, I think the unintended consequences of some of the blindness that we can give to players are the most exciting changes that CCP can make. And I think that's where the core of blackout was. Let's, let's take away this real information. But what really hurt them was that in, in uh, real time feedback on who's getting killed, FCs would look at Z kill in real time and see if their own fleet, was holding up 
or if they were losing the fight. In real time, they can make strategic decisions through Z Killboard in real time. And that's just not, that is a radar, essentially. You know, and, and it's a radar known only to advanced players and advanced FCs. And they have much more than that, uh, that they have figured out that a new FC doesn't have. So if you're going out there as a new FC and you're kind of nervous and you don't want to get your guys killed, but it's exciting, understand that if you lose, it's not because you're a bad Eve player. It's because the FC that you may be up against knows a lot more tools of the trade and is getting a lot more help than you may know about. So it's not your fault. Anyway, so uh, a battle just happened. So we'll go ahead and put up that battle report. It's called, speaking of Z Killboard. Too much talking. And did it come through? It didn't come through, did it? I'll do that again. There it is. While you're doing that, I want to just quickly also update people that uh, in case you haven't heard, the Dragonar sites, the new sites that spawn in Losec um, for a few more days have been buffed. So they uh, they now can drop the, the low-grade uh, implants, which I assume is a different, like on top of all the rest, which only makes it more likely that you get some blueprint. Um, but also the overseer effects that have dropped uh, or that are dropping are now higher grade. So you get more per site anyways. So I don't know if that makes it worth worth um, running yet um, for people. It's up to you. Uh, you can solo it technically in a Drake Navy issue. I recommend actually a small team. You require heavy missiles. Good luck. Okay. looks like fraternity took, uh, well, one guy probably took a beating here well ship's bonus with heavy missiles sorry yeah so trigger happy a uh, group in the uh, north area went to venal and took out fraternity uh, they had a super there uh, sorry they had a titan so ragnarok was destroyed uh, belonging to Sil sylvester rosa and uh, along with that probably uh, a fax machine that tried to save it and uh, also a, a super a Kaldari Shield Super. What's that called again? I should know this. It's the Wavern. Yeah, don't see many of those. They're going to become more popular, though. Jumped in to probably help save it. Uh, you also lost some dreads in the process. Probably what happened there is somebody got caught. They tried to save it, but Trigger Happy uh, overcame that with a dread bomb and took out 93 billion worth of ships, uh, especially uh, Ragnarok. So that just happened a few minutes ago. Trigger Happy is somebody we've been looking at now for, oh, six months at least, um, maybe since it started. And it was a group that uh, we paid a lot of attention to because they were the new hotness in EVE Online. Um, well, if you're not talking about Inner Hell, you know, you're talking about Trigger Happy. So that's what we were looking at. Hey, Xylex, thanks very much for the subscription uh, and good morning to you. It's one of our main uh, patrons. Remember I said all this runs on the uh, help of patrons because the one that, they're the ones that show us like we're growing and uh, Xylex is a big part of that. So thank you very much. Um, Trigger Happy, again, is a group that we've been looking at for a while and uh, it was started by um, a guy from uh, Sig from Imperium. Kendar is his name. Uh, he was a very well-liked um, FC. People followed him in the combat. He's one of the SIGs that really softened up the North in 2018 before the floodgates opened to massive amounts of warring um, where the Imperium essentially ravaged the North and then came back later and just destroyed the place after it was abandoned because it couldn't be defended. And... Um, Kendar was kind of the, the tip of the spear on that, but he has since left uh, the Imperium. I don't know under what circumstances, and he started this group called Trigger Happy. 
Consequently, you saw another FC from the Imperium become very dissatisfied with the way things are run. Uh, his name is Pittsburgh, and he also joined Trigger Happy. Uh, so Trigger Happy has been a collection point of uh, talented FCs that put in the work and are interested in the combat, but not on an N plus one scale, meaning blobbing or having overwhelming forces. These guys want to have fights that are relatively more exciting and have less numbers and stuff like that. So, um, oh, good. Looks like, uh, so he dread bombed an XIX fleet from midpoint Citadel for jump freighters. I don't, I don't know if that has to do with this kill mail. So, I'll, but anyway, this happened up in Vino. And so, uh, Kendar is no longer the leader of trigger happy that shifted over to somebody else. And I need to look up his name. His name I hadn't heard of before. Um, so he, he's no longer, uh, the leader there, but trigger happy is still active as you can see. And I see what you're saying. Elder, elder ipt, um, Kendar, uh, he dread bombed an XIX fleet from a midpoint citadel for jump freighters. Yeah. And I don't know about that. I wish I did know more about the circumstances of why Kendar left uh, the Imperium, but if it was circumstances that are anything similar to Pittsburgh's leaving, uh, Pittsburgh was, technically he left, but he was given no option. He had a few days to move out. He was essentially kicked out. Absolutely true. And he was kicked out because he was, I believe, causing tension between um, <clears throat> he was kicked out as, as an example to others that you cannot go against the diplomatic corps in Goonswarm. Goonswarm is a leader of the Imperium, and they have bases in Test, which is an ally, not ally, right? In 2018, they were the Imperial, the Imperial Legacy Coalition, I think, and uh, since the war is over they've kind of stood down and they're now just kind of technically on paper they're gray which means they're not allied but realistically they are allied they have a mutual defense uh, pact where if one gets attacked the other one helps out something along those lines and so anything that kind of threatens that from the goons perspective like their fcs like a goon swarm fc going out and dread bombing test um you know you're going to get your your chain pulled right because you're you're kind of an attack dog and they're like nope not there and that's what the diplomatic corps did they're like don't do that and then he did it again and they're like we're going to execute you as an example to everyone else you got to pay attention to the deals that we make even if it and this is one of the narratives that came out of it from pittsburgh even if it means boring your coalition to death right if you're bored, sorry, but we're not going to let you fight, even if it's uh, just for funsies or whatever, because you're disrupting our relationship with Test, so you got to go. Uh, so he went, and he was really hot under the collar. And uh, what happened next was very interesting. He got together with uh, Olmeca Gold and uh, uh, Marshy, I believe, and they created an opportunity for uh, to take out a locust fleet, which um, for those that don't know what a locust fleet is, Imperium has moons that come out, I think once every two weeks. And they time them so they all happen kind of at the same time. <clears throat> and so what that allows them to do is basically say, this fleet for four hours is going to be like a pack of locusts coming into crops and just eat everything. Uh, so these, this, this is going to be a well-protected fleet, a very well-protected fleet. So we're going to bring out the biggest mining ships we can, the Rorkles. And we're going to go in and we're going to hit moon after moon after moon after moon and just devour everything. And it's basically cashing in all that moon uh, uh, stuff that they have. And those are very, very hard to destroy because they are very well defended by a lot of super capitals on standby right? It's a focal point of, of their mining efforts. So to hit that is like hitting, you know, a bank with armed guards and, you know, armor everywhere. It is a very difficult thing to do. But since um, 
Pittsburgh was somebody that knew exactly how they worked because he was in charge of the security for those locust fleets. He knew how to hit them and when. So they, they put up, a, and what he did was when he got into cahoots with these other guys, they're like these guys, Olmeca and Marshy, they're like massive multi-boxing uh, poachers and they know how to execute and fast. So the combination of knowing how to hit this locust fleet and then having the firepower out of very few people to do it makes it a very well-kept secret. And so when the locust fleet shows up and they're about to devour some stuff in Fountain, Pittsburgh throws out a fake Sino. And about one third, I think, 66 dread, 66 of those mining ships, I think it was like 150... 140 total, but 66 of those guys jump without um, realizing they're jumping to a trap. And so they are, they jump into a trap. The dreadnoughts uh, show up and just start wiping them out. And the defense fleet uh, jumps in to try to defend them, but it takes some time to do that. Uh, so they were able to take out a massive, massive amount of Rorkles. Uh, I think they killed um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, I believe, 40 to 60. I forget what the number is. Maybe it was like 60, 65 is what I heard, but I think it, it, it rounded down to like 63. I don't know. But many, many more than has ever been done before. And so that's what Pittsburgh was able to do with... Um, the help of some other people. And now he is an FC for Trigger Happy. So he is part of that group, that X mm, group, X FC group from the Imperium, from Goon Swarm. And they are hanging out in the north and they just picked off uh, in Venal some fraternity guys that are up there. And why are fraternity guys up north with super, uh, with Titans? Because they brought about 40 for this fight. Uh, so they're up there. And because they didn't win this fight that happened uh, eight hours ago in Venal, they're, they're going to have to stay. Um, instead of coming up, doing this one attack and wiping out uh, the staging ground for Ranger Regiment, they now have to wait until another opportunity arises. So they may be up there for a couple weeks. And Fraternity does not like Ranger Regiment. Uh, uh, I, and actually, I don't know if they don't like Ranger Regiment, but they don't like Army of Mangoes, uh, which are now aligned with Ranger Regiment. These are Chinese groups. I'm not going to talk about their, you know, whatever history they have in the, the Serenity server. A lot of them didn't, didn't even exist on the Serenity server. A lot of these players didn't exist there. So, but uh, we'll talk about here and now, in Tranquility, there are Chinese groups that do not like each other, Fraternity being one of them. Uh, and a lot of the anger between them is the classic personal anger that is the leaders don't like each other for some reason. And that's the kind of stuff that generates um, content because these leaders spin these narratives to say, this is why we're going to war against them. And that's what creates um, not fighting, not what you have where people are just fighting for fun. That's where you have real EVE Online wars of annihilation, wars of survival of annihilations. So that's what we're looking at. All right. It's uh, 10 o'clock. We've been on for an hour and a half and uh, we just did a really long episode for fun. Shouldn't have been this long. The first half hour was all fixing stuff. But anything else you guys want to talk about before we go? Thanks for the participation. Uh... I talked about the Ravenor sites or the Dragonor sites. I talked about the uh, well, the the uh, the one uh, weird uh, thing is is that the Vimoksha chorus detail. But if you don't want to go into that right now, that's fine. Well, let me just wrap up this detail that I got wrong. I don't know if I got it wrong. Oh, but I, okay. But I didn't. I didn't actually. I don't know if I said why is uh, a Titan up there in the north. This particular one lived up there anyway. Um. So according to William Weiss there, it says, to be honest, the Titan that died is from a corp that have always lived in Venal, even before joining fraternity. 
So it was a local they got killed. That doesn't negate the point that Fraternity was up there with about 40 Titans last night, and they are probably going to have to stay up there or come back up. Maybe they're going to actually come back up. They won't actually just stay there. Which is a long trip, if you think about it. They're actually in Drone Regions area in Owasa. Oh my god, we didn't even talk about the econ economics of uh, yeah. Owasa, right? Owasa is a region in Drone Region Federation. Ah, sorry, not Drone Region Federation. They're in, in the Drones region, and uh, where now NCPL and Horde live, and Fraternity moved up there after they were defeated by Test. And man, have they really been uh, ratting the heck out of uh, those areas? Yeah. They almost caught um, up to Delve. For the first time in a while, we have returned to post blackout levels when it comes to ISK movement and trading and all that. So, you know, this is good. This is good. Uh, let's talk about MERs. Uh, let's see. That's the June report. Let's see. This is going to be 2020. I'll bring that up on screen. Economic report for January. And here's an online version. Let me grab that for you. Let's talk about that. We, we've not talked about that. Maybe we'll talk about it on, uh, uh, the TIS report, uh, Sunday. But the monthly economic report came out for January. That's provided by CSP Larrikin. For those that don't know, he actually worked on the AI before he became the statistics guy. He puts out this analysis stuff. For those that don't know, EVE Online used to have an economist, and then they had uh, a data visualist named Quant, who was really cool. Uh, he could really put stuff out. And now it's Larrikin, who uh, was an AI before that. But he is an Australian-born EVE Online player, also known as... Dark Razor, and he was a big general in the Fountain War on behalf of um, Northern Coalition, actually. Uh, that group, VDD, is still in Northern Coalition. That's the corporation that he belonged to. They moved over to Pandemic Legion for a while, but they are now back in Northern Coalition. And they were fighting last night, Seven, uh, led by Malachi, I think he was their FC. Anyway, Larrikin, great player, uh, love talking to him, funny guy. Puts out an MER, a monthly economic report. And the monthly economic report really surprised some people, kind of stunned some people, really. When you look at this statistic here, was it Geminate? No, that's total destroyed. That's not what I want to look at. Um, we want to look at, here it is. No, that's not it either. Well, this is January 2019. I'm on the wrong year. What I want is 2020. That was a year ago. You can see Delve was just, destroying everybody so a year ago delve was uh people were ratting and mining and delve uh like crazy here's the october 2020 that's not what i'm looking for here it is uh december oh right because we're in january that makes more sense so this is the last month of last year and normally you would see delve just dominate um but what you have instead is this surprise that I think kind of shocked everyone. Now, mining value, yeah. You're going to mine where it's safe in deep space. and where um, So Delve is still clearly number one. It goes off the chart, really. Uh, doubles anybody else. But where there was a big shock is here. And this is the MPC bounties per region. And there should only be one tower here, and it should be Delph, and it should be way up there. But you have almost, you have twin towers, uh, so you can't see it, but I'll just read it to you. The first one is Delph, so they did win, and that is uh, the Imperium's area, Goonswarm area. But then you have Owasa, and Owasa is fraternity. And so uh, over four trillion in a month of uh, ratting going on. Now, the first thing that everybody says is the usual... They're Chinese, they're botting, uh, this is unfair, someone needs to stop them, CCP please go over there and just uh, smite botters, this is, this is, they're not capable of doing what Delve does, and that is not true. Uh, I talked with them, and from their perspective, they are one of the most active groups in the game, and 
they have an enormous amount of activity. Um, when you look at their kill board, it matches their NPC uh, kills. So a very strong case can be made that they are actually just extremely dedicated and active. And they are dedicated to uh, playing EVE Online. And when there's nothing going on, you're going to go and mine NPCs. Uh, mine's the wrong word. You're going to go shoot NPCs for ISK, for money. And so uh, they have a lot of time, since they're not engaged in a war, to do the ratting that they need to do in order to generate income to create a stronger military so that they can go to war. Uh, so without being at war, they caught up to Delve in one month. It's just amazing. And it's not only that. The third group that you see there is actually Outer Passage, Branch, Cobalt Edge. What do they all have in common? They're all neighboring regions in the drone regions. So not only Owasa, but Outer Passage, Branch, Cobalt Edge. Those are the big pillars that you see there. And together, those are much bigger, much bigger than Delve. So something crazy is going on uh, in that area. So what this says to me as well is that that is a new vector for attack. <laughs> We will, this year, see an attack, probably from the Imperium or Test, some kind of incursion into drones to stop this economic miracle from getting off the ground. Because we all know that an economic miracle leads to a military miracle. That is how the Imperium was able to turn 400 Titans, 450 Titans, into over 1,000 Titans in six months which is a complete distortion of the game. It's done through the economics, which they knew first. Um, everybody knew it, but only they had the superstructure to make it happen, or the interest. I think other people just wanted to, to fight and to make enough money, but not to, not to empower every player in your alliance to be... Uh, Someone that is a, a you know, a ca super capital capable pilot. It is, it is a distortion to the game to have so many people in centerpiece ships like super capitals. And it's just completely broken. Uh, and it's driven a lot of players out of the game who just don't see a future for really like uh, smaller engagements. Um, so it, it, is, it, is, it is a problem that CCP knows. They've known it since last summer, maybe since last year. They're trying to fix it. That's where a lot of the work's going. Hi, Teddy, how are you doing? I'm all right, how are you guys? Good, I threw, I threw you in at the deep end because I was like talking to you about wormholes and stuff. Look at this, look at this, I love this. I'm looking at my public voice channel and you can't see them unless they talk, but I got Astrothy in there. I got Fawn Sway in there. I got Lichgrave in there. Roliat and Teddy. And for those that don't know, these names that I've just listed are incredibly knowledgeable players that are fun to talk to. I learn stuff every day from these guys. And Astrothy. I said you first. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, there's a lot oh. of knowledge. <laughs> And Astra. And then there's Ash. <laughs> <laughs> These are the great players of EVE Online and Ash. <laughs> no, I, I put you up there, Ash. Oh, you know what's nice is that it's... mistake. <laughs> EVE Online has a lot of different game styles, so people can be really... Uh, I mean, Fonsui is a savant when it comes to a certain, a certain gameplay. It's usually multiple levels of gameplay, but it's, it's uh, you know, Teddy can tell us something about wormholes that um, others can't. And Fonswee can tell us something about Triglavians that others can't. And, and the list goes on and on. I could tell you something about shield region that I don't want to. <laughs> I summed up earlier. Is it bad? Is it bad, Fonswee? How bad is it? Um, I am disappointed that the implants were added uh, without any of the other 
changes to the regen for shield and capacitor ecosystem. And without any further plans for um, the shield booster armor repper and the resist module rebalance. Have they stated there are no further plans? No, he's just, they just haven't oh. stated anything. They haven't said plans. anything. Yeah. He's Esen essentially, no stated further plans. Yeah. Not stated no further plans. Oh, I got it. Yeah, the, the only information that we have been given is uh, at Eve North, we were made some promises that weren't kept. Uh, then we were kind of not given promises, but more updates like, hey, this is why that stuff didn't happen yet. We're going to try to do it this way. And that happened at Vegas. And then we got the that, that one post towards the end of the year from Team Talos with the picture of the shield with the Sancho logo on it. And that's it. So there's like 15 changes, you know, there's like a, there's like a 15 point plan that they have put together and we've gotten like a fraction of one of those points. And my issue with that is that that kind of, um, that kind of breaks the ecosystem as it stands, like those implants going in without any stacking penalties or any of the other sort of changes that were planned is unbalanced. The, so the, the, the balanced team, unbalanced game. <laughs> well, the thing that exasperated the problem is, like, CCP has been going in this direction of telling us less and less, or at least with less and less warning, um, in order to keep us kind of on our toes more. Um, and in this case, they didn't give us the patch notes until the day of the patch, which meant we had no idea any of the details there's no dev blogs there were no nothing outlining what what the nirvana implants were going to look like there is nothing about anything sissy was closed for that entire time um and so there was no there and there's been no communication about it since so i understand that ccp is interested in in like closing down their communication but having this be the the time that they've done it like like locked it down that much at the same time as doing this change, which is so has such a long history of of stated known problems with doing it, yeah. uh, causes a lot of confusion. So it'd be nice to know, like, have some sort of dev blog now that it's out to explain what's going on now. Yeah, like, tell me what your roadmap is, and I don't want like dates on things. Just tell me the steps, and however long it takes, it takes but show me the steps that you're going to take. And that's, you know, my first question. After, after that, it's a... Uh, so, well, another point, really. Part of the reason why they're not sharing as much is not only to keep us on our toes, which is, which is correct. They're trying to, you know, present us with stuff and not, quote-unquote, spoil it before by letting it show up on Hobo Leaks, but they're also trying very hard to make only the promises that, that they can keep. And right now, that is a very short list right now. So they are not saying much of anything. And I, I respect that decision and I appreciate that decision because they're attempting to restore value to their word, which had not been very valuable up until this point. I don't know. I think that's overblown that, you know, the the trust issue, this was brought up recently at TIS because um, January, the producer was saying, hey, can we do this? riff on <clears throat> the trust issue with CCP and talk about some of the stuff that Jintan said on how CCP could earn trust back. And I was just like, garbage, not going to do it. We're not going to talk about it. But it's perfect for this because this is a discussion, right? So we can talk about it here. For a show, we want that to be about news and what players are doing, not about what we think uh, as much. This is totally okay for that sort of thing. But I do want to say, I think that Trust issue from CCP is overblown, uh, in my opinion. Like, m maybe I'm a lot more of a true believer, but I think it fits into a. I think it fits into a, a way of pressuring CCP to get the changes done that you want to get done. Like, hey man, nobody believes you, so you better deliver, and you better deliver on this. You know, and they did deliver, and guess what? It's a distortion to the game now. You have these shield slaves that are theoretically. Theoretically, a problem, uh, and they'll fix it. I think, unless they want to let ride for hope. a while. Yeah, I don't. The problem is that I don't know what their plans are now. Now, now all bets are off, and I don't know what they're thinking because they didn't. They didn't tell me what they were thinking before they released it, 
and they didn't tell me what they were thinking after they released it either. So mm-hmm. that is that is my issue. Like a, a change like this to the core of regen and tanking deserves a dev blog on the mechanics changes that they plan. The uh, the implants themselves, the the shield capacity implants, are not a solution. They are part of an ecosystem that is supposed to work. Like right now, uh, you have armor reppers and shield boosters and all those stuff and and ships built that have a low end a mid range and a high end they have cheap modules and expensive modules and then when you get very expensive then you have implants uh regen simply doesn't have that the low end is entirely too powerful because of the lack of stacking penalties so people cannibalize their entire ship and fill it with regen the mid range is the same but also cannibalizes your ship and the high end simply does not exist so in order to balance it then low the low and mid have to be nerfed and changed so that they they are less powerful and also don't cannibalize your ship and the high end has to be created which doesn't currently exist the implants are a part of that solution so to release the implants part of the solution without releasing the part that nerfs the low end and makes it not cannibalize your ship and nerfs the mid range and not makes it cannibalize your ship is just further unbalancing an already unbalanced ecosystem right by not by saying not cannibalizing a ship meaning you don't have to make a choice you can have the uh, yes the as of now you stack first. all of your slots with regen mods because that's what you do to get more oh you need more regen get the better module no there isn't one uh get the implants no there aren't just put more modules because there's no stacking the, so what you end up with is, is that, losing everything else yeah the problem is is that the there are mid slot and low slot regen mods and rigs so the these ships that are trying to pull this off are often filling as much of all three of those as they possibly can. So that's why this works best on battleships and it works best on ships with three rig slots and, you know, other attributes obviously can play in as well, but it's just an unbalanced system. It, it works on certain hulls for the wrong reasons. It doesn't work on other hulls for the wrong reasons. It works in situations it shouldn't. It doesn't work in situations it should. It's just extremely limited and unbalanced. And there were solid plans that made perfect logical sense already laid down to bring it into line. And now only a piece of that has been done with no word on the rest. I see. So. If I may play devil's advocate for a minute, though, it we are currently in the middle of the event that is functioning as the rollout for these implants, and and it I mean we just got the low, uh, the low end version. Why, why do you think I sound like this and not like this? I, I understand, <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, like for for clarification for everybody, um, the event isn't over yet. And so I actually don't expect any uh, description of what's going on until after the event. I would I would like a post mortem of the event that also goes into what these things are, or maybe a dev blog about what's going on with these things that also includes a brief post mortem of the event. When, whatever. Let me uh, ask Teddy uh, if you're there. Have you guys in wormhole space? Um, has this changed anything for you? Uh, not not myself personally. But, there aren't uh, enough I implants, see, I and they aren't cheap enough. So they're not really in the game yet. They're available. Correct. You have to you have to really salvage for them. Oh, maybe that is. Uh, are they buying time with that? Like the scarcity. They are in fact buying time with yeah. that. They are what they're doing is they're they're turning on the faucet very 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 slowly and they're allowing a couple of these in and seeing what happens. I just don't think that they're necessarily getting good data from what happens because it doesn't have any of the other mechanical changes along with it. But yeah, they draw very little. They're very expensive, etc. This event is going away and they're going to have to find a new home, so they may shut them off for a while. But again, so devil's advocate, um, the the things that need to be tested most are the things, the people who can purchase the really, really expensive implants, and they will use them in fights, and therefore, he may end up getting the data he actually needs, which is these being used oh. in a tie-dye environment mm-hmm. without actually having to see... <laughs> Right, and that's and that's all well and good. I am all for that. Uh, 
I like I like that narrative. The problem is they could have shared at least a smidgen with us, and they've shared absolutely nothing. So I, I am led to uh, I am led to believe the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these shield slaves dropping very rarely. So if this is if they're letting them into the game, then they're letting in them into the game very very slowly, so they can keep an eye on what the real world implication is for those things. And they're also creating an immense amount of geography, right? There is now something very valuable to either fight over or to trade for, uh, which is an interesting byproduct of all of that. But the reason that people aren't affected by this is because all the effects are right now theoretical. So people are saying this is possible, but none of it is actually happening because these things are so rare. There, there actually is some kind of um controversy that has as far as i'm concerned been been put to bed and a lot of people were making the claim that uh the shield regen code was broken and was not interacting with time dilation properly and therefore was behaving normally while everything else was time delayed uh time dilated so that uh was countered directly by ccp this week, I think a couple of days ago, Ash pointed it out to me. And that was an important like beat to hit for this. Cause like if you could have super capitals with, uh, you know, with instantly, you know, full regen shields mm -hmm. outside of time dilation, that would be very broken, but that is, that is in fact not the case. Okay. Yeah. And that would have reminded us of something that happened with, uh, the, I believe the shield regen for keeps for citadels when they first came out were, or their vulnerability time was not affected by tie-dye, which made it nearly impossible to take out a, a keep star when they first came out, but that was later adjusted. So what that means essentially, and let's see if uh, I can explain this, if not one of you guys that are smarter than me can explain it. But when you get into a, a, a time delayed, it is delayed by the way, not dilated. Uh, I looked it up. Uh, but a time delayed situation, a tie-dye situation, <clears throat> Time slows down for everyone because the game accepts commands slower, which means that real time is happening slower. Um, so if your generation of shield, getting your shield back, is happening in real time and not in game time, it's happening much faster. So you're essentially becoming immune to damage because you repair yeah, it all. Basically, the server f the people were saying the server was forgetting to slow down your shield regen as it slowed down yeah. everything else. Okay, so hold on. So the game functions on a one-second tick, right? So everything fi fires off once a, once a second. The server processes everything and then sends out its, its results. Uh, t time dilation uh, occurs when uh, the server cannot keep up with that and perform one second worth of action in a second. Otherwise, it would start to fall behind and eventually crash. So... Um, what it does is it basically internally slows down how much time is between a tick. So now a tick is two seconds or up to 10 seconds. So that would be 10% 10, 10 tie dye. The problem is, is that there are some functions that don't work on the tick system and don't count against ticks, but count against the clock. And if so, if they count against the clock, then it doesn't matter how much things are tie dyed because it'll check how much time has passed between it real time and then process off of that. So there are a few things in the game that process on the clock as opposed to the tick system. There's an accusation that this is one of them. Uh, a dev came in and said that they had checked and that that wasn't true. Mm. Well, I do know this is this has been the hot topic for the last week ever since this... Uh, thing here let's talk about one more thing even quadrants they're going to be doing essentially development seasons where they uh, every three months uh, throw in some new stuff make some adjustments uh, what do you guys think of this new quadrant system i think having a having a 90 day focus for for dev is probably going to be helpful because it keeps keeps things fresh for them it gives them enough time to really get into a groove and produce something useful. Yeah. It just seems like um, 
it, it just seems very reasonable to say uh, we're going to have short-term plans. So the pathway for EVE Online may not be as clear to players because I think it's not that clear for um, CCP in specific ways. I think in thematic ways, it's probably very clear. They probably have a very good idea on where they want to go. And uh, I think we're still in an era where they, they want to make the environment alive that players can react to. They want to make it difficult for uh, veteran players and advanced players. And most importantly, they want to make it easier for players in the incoming funnel to learn the game. And by that funnel, I mean like, you know, people were getting stuck at two minutes into the game. They'd be like, I can't play this. I don't even know what, what direction up is. And trying to get people past that point to the next point, then to the next point, then to the next point. So people who used to end at two minutes may make it to four. And those people who used to end at four minutes might make it to 15 minutes. And then those people make it to one day. And then those people make it to one week. And next thing you know, you have more player retention, which means a larger population for EVE Online, which makes everything work better. Because the more people play this game, the more incentives there are to win a game that a lot of people are playing. The more incentives there are to play a game that is very difficult to win. Uh, all these things are incentivizing actual desire to play this game. Uh, the more people play it, the more incentive you have, the more possibilities, the more hope you have of interesting things happening. The harder the game is, the more prestigious it is to master it. And uh, so that's those are the long-term plans that EVE has. So how do you get there? Well, they're chopping that into quadrants. Four times a year, just like a quarterly report, uh, they are going to plan and execute on certain design certain design changes that will either bring in new stuff or um, balance pass stuff that's already been brought in in the past. And so those quadrants are going to have themes. And this first quadrant, this first quarter of 2020, is fight or flight. And that started on the 16th, and that's been in for a little bit now. And I think that mostly revamped missiles, right? Yeah, that was one of the big yeah, ones. Heavy missiles. So, so far, so far. Yeah. But um, there's, uh, it's, it's the entire quarter, and we're just at the end of January. Right, but it's more than that. It's also the fact that, uh, so they put in a PVE site, right? But they did they did a PVE event really. That's but a it, Dragonar now, Blitz dungeon. Yeah, but it's exclusively in Losac. Oh. So, so it's yeah, it the, is encouraging this fight or flight mentality, right? So, do I stay? Do I fight? Or do I run and let it go? Whatever, right? The PVE challenge of that site was tuned to the level of Tech One Battleship with Tech Two fitting. That was tech, that tech was what Fozzie. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Tech One. My bad. Tech One Battle Cruiser with a Tech Two fitting. That was like the approximate difficulty for the entire site that was targeted. Uh, I th but the fact that it's in low sec means it's a whole other ball of wax. Yeah, I think glass cannons. When I think of uh, battle cruisers with T2s, what am I missing? Uh, well, not not we're not about like Drake Navy cruisers. issue. Yeah, the combat battle cruisers. Oh, Drake Navy issue. Okay, that's a heck of a lot yeah, not, of uh, shields. Yeah, not the not the Naga to, so, Oracle, you know, so, NATO. Right, right, right. So the key is is that it's heavy missiles only, or sorry, ships that are bonused for heavy missiles only, which means for only the cruisers, battle cruisers, and battleships that have a bonus that directly mention. Uh, missiles or heavy missiles or rapid heavy missiles. It, it actually it doesn't have to mention the heavy missiles. It just has to work on heavy missiles oh, because a, okay. gen a generic yeah. missile bonus works because it includes them. So the rat. That's why the rattler can get in. Yeah, yeah. Got so, Hela and rattle. Hela can go in. By the way, you don't actually have to use missiles in this site. You can use correct. drones because you could bring a Hela. But the the allowed in list is ships that can use heavy missiles and would receive a bonus to those heavy missiles. So, Correct. We had a gnosis. We had a blaster gnosis. What is a a, a, a dragon R? Oh boy. Okay. So no, actually, this isn't that bad. This isn't that, well, this the isn't funny that part is that the, the, the dragon R part isn't the interesting part. Oh no. Yeah, that's true. No. So the dragon R's um, uh, are the Templus dragon R's are a terrorist organization 
who in the early days of the tension between the Caldari and the Galente, um, when the blockade was going on, they are the group that is accused of of bombing um, Ravenor, the city uh, under the... Uh, they had this city underwater with this dome, uh, and they blew up the dome and killed everybody in the city, and that kind of triggered the uh, Caldari... Uh, the first Galente Caldari War, um, and so this is they 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 are also most recently known because they were kind of Tybus Heth's uh, in the pocket guys. So um, you know Tybus Heth kind of took control of the Caldari state, seized control back of uh, Caldari Prime, um, and then kind of fell from grace and was ran out of town as presumed killed, but his he kind of brought back into power a little bit this group, but then they've mostly been gone since then, and that's like 2010, 2011 era. So we haven't heard from them very much since then. But now they're back specifically to help this other splinter cell known as the Vamoksha Chorus. And that's where it gets interesting. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, take it. That's the, that's the well, no, that's that's more honest than me. But that's that's the oh. boss of the site. So after you clear out all these Dragonar rats, then the Vamoksha envoy shows up in a nightmare, and that's the guy that drops the the blueprints for the implants. And and uh, the Vamoksha chorus, as Ash is about to tell you all about, is very scary. The boss. Yeah, the boss is so, dungeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. The, the nightmare. It's the Vamoksha envoy. How tough uh, are they? Uh, 300, I mean, 341 uh, DPS at 80 kilometers with 20 tracking, and he has webs and newts. So good luck and scrams. So he can apply damage well, even to small ships. It can do a ton of damage yeah. per second, even at a long out, range. Out to 80. So you can't get away from this. this. Yeah, if you're, if you're close, then you're scrammed and neuted, and if you're far, then you're just getting pegged. Yeah. But it's okay because you're a missile ship. Go. <laughs> yeah. So you, in theory, you can actually outrange his eighty if you use like super long range light missiles and stuff. So long range missiles, and they always hit, so you don't uh, have to worry yeah. about fall off and stuff like that. Yeah. So right. they designed it that way. They wanted to give heavy missiles some love. Use heavy missiles. Got it. So this is where you use your heavy missiles. You don't have to, right. but this is where you should. Ash, what what this what can you tell us about this boss? Okay. So uh, the Vamoksha we first heard of uh, back right after Invasions, they released this new skin for the Sancha into the premium store called True Deliverance. And in that skin's description is a quote, uh, basically uh, talking smack uh, about everybody and their and how there will be no uh, there will be no pity, there will be no running, there will only be you know deliverance or whatever. Anyway, it's by this guy named Cornelius Sedek. Um, it says it's from the ruins of the station, and it says that he is the former true citizen, um, and he is now the head of the Vamoksha Chorus. And this is the first time we've ever heard of the Vamoksha Chorus or Cornelius Sedek. Mm -hmm. So, um, hold on. So, uh, from there we start seeing more and more stories about the Vamoksha Chorus in the, the lore, uh, even pertaining directly to invasions that were occurring. Um, and it seemed as if the Vamoksha Chorus was the group of Sancha that the Triglavians were specifically targeting. Like, uh, you, we would constantly get stories about like the Vamoksha raiding some colony, and then maybe right after that, uh, an invasion would hit that same area. Um, so basically, we don't we we knew very very little about this, and then eventually we learned that this is a splinter cell that broke off during the time that Sancho was like gone, um, and now it follows this this other guy, Cornelia Sedic, and they they are much more aggressive. And yeah, the word if, if Sancha wasn't crazy enough, yeah, yeah, like yeah, these guys, yeah, uh, so, yeah, this is like, like a fanatical version of Sancha. Yeah. So, um, 
And so these these guys are very, very aggressive. And um, this is the first time we've ever seen them in game, which is very interesting because we've been watching them for like almost a year now. Um, and oh, yeah, the word Vimoksha means Nirvana. So that's the implants are tied directly to them. Mm. Um, so how they relate to all of this, whether or not they are the 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 Sancha that the that the that is pissed off the Triglavians, um, you know what is going on with that? Nobody nobody really knows. Um, well, but one, one thing we can be certain of though is that they intend to progress the Vimoksha story and right. not the Dragonar story because killing the Dragonar rats does nothing, and killing the Vimoksha envoy reduces your faction with a brand new faction. Correct. That was what I was getting to, which is that they have put in a faction now for the Vimoksha Chorus. So when you kill that rat, it gives you a negative 0 0.001 or whatever standing with the Vimoksha Chorus, which means they're tracking your standings. And I, uh, and I checked, and it is intentional. Wow. So, so not only have they now... So they've, basically what's happened is that they've started experimenting with these new rats that basically apply and act and behave just like players. And by that, I don't mean that they fly like players, but I mean that they respond to your application in a way that player ships would. So you can newt them, you can scram them, you can damp them, you can ship scam them, you, you can, can rep, rep them. them. You can do whatever you want. And they basically, uh, it affects them as it would affect a player, which is pretty darn cool. You can even jam them. Hmm. So uh, the Triglavians for the invasions were the first, and now they've kind of expanded out to the empires using the uh, flashpoints. And now with these Dragonars, they're experimenting with these different ships of different sizes and, and power, so that way they can apply them um, you know, in different configurations. So they're basically building a better rat at this point. Yeah, give, giving giving these ships the ability to respond to uh, e-war, to energy war specifically, uh, is very interesting because it was a very manual process. They had to give them all capacitors. They had to give them all a capacitor regen rate. They had to give all of their uh, special abilities capacitor cost you know and all of these things in order to make it actually work so the one thing that they haven't done is they don't make they don't make the rats guns shut off if you dry their caps out but everything else shuts off hmm. well so this is a looks like a limited time event it started on the 16th it's going to end on the 27th which is i think tuesday isn't yep it? no sunday yeah so yeah, very soon so the that's monday Monday. The other thing that drops from these envoys are these um, logs, and it's these two different lore items, and the logs talk about, it, it, one is the Vimoksha log, one is the uh, Dragonar log, and they're both basically discussing about a rendezvous, where it, it appears as if the Vimoksha are effectively going to hiring the, uh, the Dragonars, and they are supposed to meet up at coordinates. And if handshake isn't processed, you know that every they'll the deal is off and all this stuff. So and it's and there's gonna be, there's coordinates that were sent. So I don't know if that is the Dragonar sites that we are crashing or if this is some future um, coordinated event that's going to happen. But we're going to find out. Yeah. So uh, if, if anyone wants to read that, you can pull up those items in game. You could just search for their name. Just search for Dragonar Vermoksha, and you'll see the lore item. You click the info, and you can read the 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 transcript of that log. The best way to learn about Eve lore is to click info on things. All right. So that's a Dragonar Blitz dungeon, sixteenth to the twenty seventh. You got till Monday to do those. They're in low sec. Check them out. And uh, last thing we want to cover, and we'll do it really quick because I have to run, is the bonus skill point weekend, which starts tomorrow. Today. Oh, today. Logged in today. Yeah, I, I, already, I already collected my first set. Oh, so what do we need to do to collect these? Just just log exactly. in, log out, and log in. You just click the button on the login screen. My bad. Am I on a... Oh, it is the 24th. I thought it was the 23rd. Yes, so it's three days, and it starts today. 
Uh, make sure you get your skill points. Log in. Uh, I haven't logged in today, no. Uh, but I will log in right after this, and then I have to actually get running. I am so pleased to see uh, such a big group watching and such a big group uh, in here with me for these uh, daily EVE Online uh, shows that we do. I'm going to say that's it for today because the impeachment trial has started and I want to watch that on my way to work. It's amazing these days that you can literally have your TV with you wherever you go if you have these little uh, uh, ear pod things uh, and Bluetooth uh, on your phone and then the streaming unlimited internet stuff is for some people just pampering oh my god but yeah it's good to be back uh, we're going to try to do a bunch of new things with talking in stations give you as much content as possible make it a conversation a living conversation and allow many voices uh, so talking in stations going forward will not be a particular show but will be an actual station all right uh thanks astrothy as always so can yeah. Have we mentioned Plex for Good? Oh, uh, we did not this episode. Because it's almost over. This is the final okay. weekend of Plex for Good, and there is going to be a 48 hour raidathon throughout uh, a whole bunch of streamers in Eve all weekend. There's going to be different stuff going on um, to entertain you and stuff and try to raise money for Plex for Good. So, where is Plex um, for Good? I don't if you want more information, anymore. just look up uh, the uh, Plex for Good Australia. Okay, yes. Somebody can link it, please. I'm sorry I couldn't find a graphic for it, but uh, Plex for Good, get in on that. It's a good way to make your Eve-isk actually mean something to people in real life that are suffering. Those things, first time in two years, important. Uh, CCP takes uh, whatever you donate in the game in the form of Plex and turns that into cash and gives it to people in need. And in this case, it's Australia that is essentially on fire. Uh, I want to say thanks to Ashtarothi, Fonswe, Roliat, Teddy, and uh, Lichgrave, who's been here since the beginning. Thanks for visiting me on this. We'll see you um, the next time we do this. And uh, we'll see you guys, the fans, on Sunday when we do Talking in Stations proper. Thank you guys for giving us information. We love this conversation going back and forth. Glad that you guys could stop in. I'm going to send you over now to the best thing I could find was G Fleet's doing a group fleet. So we're going to go ahead and raid them. Why not? And then the rest of us are going to actually uh, jump into public and finish our conversation there too. I don't know who I'm raiding. Whoa. Here. What's that? The th if you're if you log in all three days this weekend, you get a million skill points. Oh, a million skill points! That is, is, it, is super it? worth it. I I thought I. It goes twenty five, twenty five, twenty five, fifty, twenty five, one million. No, that's, I thought it was a million too. It's hundred k. <laughs> Don't confuse us. I thought it was a million too. I got really what? excited. Let's and check I double that checked, out. and it was hundred k. No, it's the same comma. What What are you even talking about? I see 100,000 oh, oh. skill points. You're right. Damn it. My, okay. my eyes, I don't know Jesus. what it is, but my eyes said a million first as well. No, seriously, I if, I, if I sit back far enough, I see three zeros. Check it out nice. on your own, but log in every day this weekend. Get in on some of that stuff and get your skill points. We will see you guys later. We'll be in here in public. Please enjoy this raid uh, for G Fleet. And we will see you Sunday. Oh, by the way, as long as uh, if you're still here, we uh, are having an Eve Echoes show tonight, Friday night. So check that out if you can. Uh, I am so pleased to see all the goodwill in chat. Uh, remember, if you're listening to Talking Stations podcast, give us a, a rating, give us a review. And if you want to help out Talking in Stations, sorry, uh, you can do that through Patreon. That is patreon.com slash Matterall. Take care, guys. We will see you around here. There's the raid. <laughs>